Liang Suchung and Lin Huiyin, a scholarly couple, gradually became well known after they were gone for years. Today, people speak of their family backgrounds and erudition, as well as Lin's beauty, flair, and romance, and Liang's obsessive love for an ancient city from half a century ago. Stories circulate about this couple, bringing them both closer, yet also sometimes farther away. In the autumn of 2007, a rare private collection brought us to the deep forests in the American Northeast. Here once lived the world-renowned historian, John King Fairbank, who established the field of modern and contemporary Chinese history in the West. In the same cottage, the intimate letters between the Fairbanks and Liang and Lin from half a century ago have been carefully stored. I wanted to show you um, my father's study. These files, and in many of the books and scrapbooks around here that we discovered a lot of the, um, um, some of the correspondence with. And some of these are from Phyllis um, Lin Wei-in, and some are from Liang Sichung, 1934. And it's um, very cute. She calls it the deluxe edition. Um, hand drawn, hand typed. And the text was by my mother, and the photographs were by Liang Sichung. And my father apparently took some of these photos as well. Um, this is a particularly wonderful item that we discovered. I discovered when um, in the back room of my parents' house in Cambridge. And I always wondered what it was, but I never had been looked into it. And so um, but this is a wonderful discovery. And apparently it was a gift from Lin Wei-in to my mother when they were leaving China in 1935. And it was uh, full of fabrics that are still in very good condition. I have some beautiful robes I'll show you later. Yeah, I'll show you. This is beautiful. Exquisite. So, um... Um, and inside the box was also delightful to discover that there was a picture of my mother and Lin Wei Yin when they would first started their friendship in the 30s. Dearest Wilma, I'm sending the red leather chest over to you. This red beauty really is quite sweet too. It has been in my Lin family for 68 years, and I'm happy that it's going abroad to yours to stay for the rest of its life, till one day it will really be an antique. In the early 1930s, the two young couples met by chance in Beiping. From then on, their correspondence continued for nearly a lifetime. Dearest darling, very dear Wilma and John, blush for all concern here. What wonderful bunch of nails that has just arrived. But my dearest darling, idiotic friend, why, why, why on earth didn't you write via Siberian on it? Do you realize that your last three letters each taken 50 days to come? These collections of aging photos and yellowing letters to palpitate with their handwritten words. They tell the stories of what happened not so very long ago. While I am typing this, begging for books. So much, so much happened. We don't know how to begin telling. Dearest Wei, anyway, this is not the letter. I have been going to write since last year. My dearest Adelaide. Phyllis and Suchung, 
Phyllis, you darling, to welcome me with such a rush of love. These letters between China and the U.S. continued for over a decade until December 1948, now, when Beiping was liberated. Perhaps only a month or two to write freely to you all in USA without postal service difficulties or whatever you For the next 20 years, the Sino-U.S. relations worsened. Their correspondence was completely cut off. In 1972, the Fairbanks visited China again. However, their most intimate friends, Liang Sicheng and Lin Huiyin, had already passed away. Beijing, a city they used to know so well, had become a strange place. Wilma Fairbank began to revisit some old places and friends in her 70s in order to write a biography of Liang and Lin, which took the next 10 years of her life to complete. Both Su Chung and Wei were children of famous fathers and distinguished families. Through them and their friends, many doors began to open for us. Liang Su Chung's father, Liang Qichao, was a pioneer thinker, political activist, master of Chinese studies and forerunner of modern Chinese media, and yet also a loving father. Liang Sicheng was born in 1901 in Japan. Two years before his birth, when the reform movement of 1898 broke out, Liang Chichao, known as the leading Kang Liang reformist, was forced into exile. In this photo, Liang Chichao appears to be more of a tender father than a thundering politician. Lin Huiyin, three years younger than Liang Sicheng, was born in Hongzhou in 1904. Her father, Lin Changmin, was also a political activist. Known for his chivalry, Lin was also a gentle and sweet father. On the margin of this group photo with Hui Yin and her cousins, Lin Changmin jotted some notes about the children. Hui Yin holds her elder cousin's hand. They appear very close, even though they always fight over sweets, and I often have to step in to mediate. As a child, Hui Yin didn't see her father very often. When she was two, Lin Changmin went to Waseda University in Japan to study politics. Lin was different from his two younger cousins, who were revolutionary martyrs. Lin Changmin aspired to work in politics to establish a constitutional government in China. He and Liang Chichao were united by their similar political ideals. In 1907, when Liang Sicheng was six, the Liangs moved to Sumako, Japan. They lived in a seaside villa. Behind the villa, there was a pine forest. As the wind passed among the trees, they could hear the waves from both the pines and the ocean. Hence, the villa was called Double Wave. The children spent a wonderful time there. Lin Huiyin's childhood, however, was not blessed with much sunshine or happiness. This is Lin Changmin's diary, preserved by the Liang household. Here, Lin Huiyin pasted several letters sent to her from her father when she was still a child. Hui Yin was intelligent and much cherished by her father since she was young. However, her father, in want of a son for the succession of the family line, married a second wife when Hui Yin was eight, and thereafter fathered another daughter and four sons. 
Huiyin's mother was no longer in favor. Family tensions left an indelible mark on her personality. In 1909, Lin Changming returned to China. Two years later, the 1911 revolution broke out. Well acquainted with the parliamentary system, Lin Changmin was elected to be Secretary General of the Provisional Senate. At the time, the little daughter could not decipher the meaning of a republic, constitutionalism or legalism, which impassioned her father's greatest commitment. In 1912, Liang Qichao ended his 13-year exile and returned to China during a period of great change and openness. Liang Qichao and Lin Changmin, two scholars nurtured by traditional Chinese culture, had both gone overseas to embrace modern Western studies. They set out to establish a completely new constitutional government. Meanwhile, they also sought to instill in their own children a new combination of both Western and Chinese education. In 1915, Liang Sicheng entered Tsinghua High School at the age of 14. His classmates included Wen Iduo, Liang Shichu, Huang Zhe, and Sun Liren. We found in the yearbook of Liang's 1923 graduating class that he had been very active. As first trumpeter, he led the Tsinghua Brass Band. He was also the second bass in the Tsinghua Choir. Gifted in the fine arts, Zhe Cheng was also editor of the Tsinghua Art Club. In addition, he designed and illustrated the 1923 yearbook in which he was hailed as an artist with a political mind, a man of letters who never fails to experience romance in his private garden. During Liang's second year at Xinhua, Lin was accepted at the Peihua Girls High School, established by the Church of England. At this time, Yuan Shukai declared himself Emperor of China. This was followed by Zhang Shun's attempt to restore the Qing Dynasty. In order to protect the Republic, Liang Qichao stepped forward at this critical juncture. The high school years for Liang and Lin appeared to be a time when their fathers were both embroiled in political events. On May 4, 1919, the massive student movement broke out. The initiators of the movement were none other than their fathers. When World War I ended in 1918, Liang Chichao traveled to Europe. Active in the diplomatic circles of the Paris Peace Conference, he urged Germany to forfeit its rights to Shandong province. Much to Liang's surprise, however, Japan had already sealed a secret deal with China's Duan regime to take over Shandong from the Germans. Extremely disappointed, Liang Chichao attempted to prevent the Chinese delegation from signing the agreement while sending a telegram to alert his comrades in China. On May 2nd, 1919, Lin Changmin published an article in the Beijing Morning Post entitled, China's Diplomatic Alert. Two days later, some 3,000 students in Beijing took to the streets. Huiyin was only a high school student at the time, but her life changed forever after the May 4th demonstrations. Since her father's article had triggered the event, he had to resign and traveled to Europe, appointed as an observer to the League of Nations. This time, he took with him his 16-year-old daughter, Lin Huiyin.
。第三，耀汝暂时离去家庭繁琐生活，彼得扩大眼光，养成将来改良社会的见解与能力。The father and daughter traveled through Europe together, with 16-year-old Hui Yin serving as her father's interpreter and secretary. Lin Changmin said, "A talented daughter is not the kind of bliss to be easily enjoyed by a father. You have to abandon your authority in order to achieve an understanding as a friend on equal footing." In London, Hui Yin entered St. Mary's College. Her father, with his charisma and talent, attracted many visitors of various backgrounds. Shu Jimo was one of them. Two years earlier, determined to strengthen China through entrepreneurship, had earned a master's degree in economics from Columbia University. Before his overseas study, Shu had declared his goals. 放尽沧海横流之际，故非一二人之力可以排傲而抵住。毕业即同志，言士曰：“民气节，革必俗。” Exposed to a foreign culture and dynamic academic exchanges, Xu became interested in Nietzsche and Russell. At age 24, in 1920, he gave up his PhD research at Columbia and went to London in search of the English philosopher Bertrand Russell, who was then a professor at Cambridge. Although Xu had already been married by his parents to a woman from his hometown and had a son, after his encounter with the 16-year-old Lin Huiyin in London, he could not resist his love for her. 在半空里，涓涓的飞舞，认明了那清幽的住处，等着他来花园里探望，飞扬，飞扬，飞扬。啊，他身上有朱砂梅的清香。Their encounter in London seemed to have swept the 16-year-old girl by a strange breeze to the doorsteps of English literature. She became enamored with Shelley, Byron, and Keats. However, in 1921, the strange breeze suddenly died down, and the Leans quickly left the UK without saying goodbye. About a year earlier, when the Lins set out for Europe, Liang Chichao had just returned to China from Europe. Liang's decision to leave politics for academia was a turning point in his life. He became preoccupied with his lectures. Liang Chichao, one of Liang Chichao's classmates at Tsinghua, recalled that the other students greatly admired Liang as an erudite and passionate scholar. As Liang Chichao lectured at Tsinghua on the emotions in Chinese verse, at one point he would cover his face, then stamp his feet, and then either abandon himself to laughter or sigh profoundly. Every time he finished a section, he would call out his son's name, "Chichang, wipe the blackboard, please." Then Chichang would jump up onto the podium and help his father clean the blackboard. In November 1921, the Lins ended their travel in Europe and returned to Beijing. Soon, a new visitor began frequenting their home. He was Liang Zicheng, the eldest son of Liang Zichao. Zicheng 祖下，你到家乡都好，会病情已略清洁，会命令我详细写信给你。这爸爸真是书籍翩翩也，比你的爸爸如何 ？The two fathers were bound in friendship, which they intended to strengthen with the marriage of their children. In the spring of 1924, Indian laureate poet Tagore was invited to visit China. Xu Jimo and Lin Huiyin accompanied Tagore as his interpreters. Jimo was still deeply in love with Huiyin, and in a letter to his mentor Liang Zichao, he wrote, 
I will seek among thousands of people my one and only soulmate. Should I find her, it is my bliss. If not, it is my fate. 这颗赤裸裸的心，请收了吧，我的爱神，因为除了你，更无人给他温慰与生命。否则，你就将它磨成齑粉，洒入西天云。但它精诚的颜色，却永远点燃你春朝的心思，秋夜的梦境。怜悯吧，我的爱神。那一晚，我的船推出了核心，城蓝的天上托着秘密的星。那一晚，你的手牵着我的手，迷惘的星夜封锁起重重。The seemingly perfect couple, Xu Jimo and Lin Huiyin, did not end up together. That night, you and me divided the direction. The two took their own life shape. Tagore realized what was happening and thus sent a poem to Lin Huiyin before departing from China. The blue of sky. Fell in love with the green of land. The breeze in between sighed, "Alas!" In 1924, Liang Sicheng and Lin Huiyin took their father's advice and went to the United States to study. Their fathers had hoped that during their studies overseas, they would get to know each other better in preparation for their marriage. Liang Sicheng and Lin Huiyin chose to study architecture in the United States. At that time, Liang's younger brother So Yong entered Harvard University to study archaeology, and his little sister So Zhuang was studying library science at Columbia University. Architecture, archaeology, and library science were all new disciplines at that time. Liang Sicheng's final choice of study was under Lin Huiyin's influence. During her travels in Europe, she had fallen in love with architecture. Which, for her, by combining art and technology, was a perfect choice. The dream that she had nurtured since she was a young girl, however, encountered the harsh reality when she began to apply to go abroad. Her father consulted overseas study organizations about the possibility of enrolling his daughter to study architecture. The letter from Mr. Liard. Then the head of the Department of Architecture reads, "Our department admits no women students in consideration of the inconvenience that students have to work with alone on drawings late at night. But other departments in the School of Fine Arts will admit women students." In 1924, Liang and Lin decided to spend their first summer in the United States at Cornell University. We don't know exactly why they came to Cornell. I guess、uh, they were st- they took drawing and they took mathematics courses at Cornell, and these are the transcripts of the grades of the courses they took. After the summer vacation, they went to Philadelphia, where Liang entered the Department of Architecture and Lin entered the Department of Fine Arts at the University of Pennsylvania. For the last 100 years, the core concept in architectural education focused on the academic neoclassical architecture as taught in Paris, then called the Beaux Arts. 
It followed that various French master architects were invited to teach in the U.S. The architecture department of Penn enjoyed the teaching of Paul Cray, who at the time had a distinguished reputation in architectural circles in the U.S. And so many Chinese, young Chinese students who, who qualified were brought to the States to study. And um, the best place to study architecture was Penn because of Paul Cray. The School of Architecture attracted a large number of students from China. So here we are in our reading room so we can take a look at some of the folders that are inside and, and discover some of the history that's here. Yeah. The archives in the architecture department show that the first Chinese student here was Zhu Bin from Guangdong, who enrolled in 1918. Chinese students achieve remarkable successes in modern Chinese architecture design and education. Between 1918 and 1927, when Liang Shicheng graduated, there were 25 Chinese students enrolled in the architecture department of the University of Pennsylvania. And in this, you see many Ds. And nowadays, we think of a D as a very bad grade. But uh, in this period, in the 1920s, D meant distinction. This was a top grade. This was an A, uh, and showed real excellence in design. Practice. And you do that, and this professor come and do it again. They give you a very short time, maybe just about three hours, maybe 12 hours to finish something. Liang wrote to his father, complaining that he spent all of his time sketching and painting, and he worried that he might end up only as a craftsman. Yuchi 我一生学问得力专在此一点。我盼望你们都能应用我这点精神。We found a card stored in the archives revealing that Lin served as an instructor in design in the Department of Architecture, although she was registered in the School of Fine Arts. At the time, they did not allow women to graduate with architecture degrees. So she graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts, even though she took almost all the classes that the architecture students did. So she really did study to be an architect. Huyin's efforts to realize her dreams could not be stopped by the regulation. We discovered in her folder an interview with the Montana Gazette, in which she told the reporter, when I go home to Peking, I will carry back to my country the message of a true meeting of East and West. We are distressed to see our native and peculiarly original art being exploited through the wild craze for keeping up with the world. There needs to be a movement to show to the people of China Western attainments in art, literature, music, drama, but not to take the place of our own, never. In China, a girl is worth only as much as her family stands for. Here, there is a spirit of democracy that I admired. As their American classmates remembered, most Chinese students were shy to speak or laugh out loud. The only exceptions were Benjamin Chen and Phyllis Lin. Chen had been Liang's classmate at Tsinghua, and even then, he was an exceptionally active person. He had been president of the YMCA at the Tsinghua. Noted for his short stature, the Tsinghua's yearbook says, he is short in stature in spite of his being president. Hizeman,
，很高兴。那两位不甚宝贝的信，也许明后天就到吧。With his four children studying abroad, Lian Qichao continued to send letters across the Atlantic. The little baby mentioned at the end of each letter referred to Liang's youngest son, Liang Sali. While the elder siblings all went overseas, Sali stayed at home with Liang Qichao. Sali, the third accommodation among Liang's nine children, later became a renowned expert on rocket control systems in China. He did a lot of things. It wasn't because I was forced or forced to do it, but it was from the heart. Now, many parents have been forgotten to do this, to do that, to do that. They don't have any interest in it. Liang Qichao, keen to learn about their overseas study and experiences, wrote his fatherly love into each of his letters to his children. Whenever his children faced career choices or emotional stresses, Liang would lose no time in sharing his thoughts and feelings with them, but always in the most gentle of ways. 关于私成学业，我有点意见。私成所学太专门了，我愿意你趁毕业后一两年，分出点光阴，多学些常识，选一两样关于自己娱乐的学问，如音乐、文学、美术等。我怕你因所学太专门之故，把生活也弄成近于单调。太单调的生活，容易厌倦。When Si Cheng and Lin Huiyin went abroad to study, Liang Qichao had reached the peak of his scholarship. Today, the news is coming out of the news. I can't tell you, and I can't tell you. You have to be calm and calm. Only a year and a half after Lian and Lin went to the United States, Hui Ying's father, Lin Changmin, became involved in the internal conflicts in the Manchuria army and was killed. You have to be very careful. You can't hurt yourself too much. Hui Ying has been so 就只靠你，林叔的女儿就是我的女儿，何况更加你们两个的关系。我从今以后把她和丝庄一样的看待。Wei Ying's father, who was also her friend, was gone without even saying goodbye. 做一个天才女儿的父亲。不是容易享的福，你得放低你天伦的辈分，先做到有意的了解。Following Liang Qichao's advice, Wei Ying didn't return to China to attend her father's funeral. Instead, she remained with Si Cheng to complete her studies. 人之生也，与忧患俱来。知其无可奈何而安之若命。你们都知道我是感情最强烈的人，但经过若干时候之后，总能拿出理性来镇住他，所以我不致受感情牵动，糟蹋我的身子，妨害我的事业。这一点，你们虽然不容易学到，但不可不努力学习。Liang's classmate wrote in his memoirs, besides architectural design, Si Cheng was enamored with architectural history and classical decor. He frequented the library in his spare time to do research, take notes, and copy illustrations by hand. After closing a book, he would sigh with admiration for the ancient design. 
The Penn's museum housed Chinese cultural relics. Among these, the most compelling collection was the stone horses from the tomb of the emperor of the Tang dynasty. Every time we visited the museum, we would go to appreciate the powerful and majestic relief sculpture in silent wonder. Sichung would linger around the burial objects of the Han and Tang dynasties. For him, archaeology was not only a hobby, but also a promising future career. Leon came to study architecture, but I think he didn't realize his role, really his mission, his mandate, as an architect and architectural historian of a country that was changing and trying to become modern in very difficult times until he saw what architecture was in the West. Liang received complete basic training to become an architect. After he systematically studied the history of Western architecture, he turned his focus to Chinese architectural history, an unexplored new field. In 1927, after graduating from the Department of Architecture, Liang applied to further his studies at Harvard. He hoped to gain a thorough understanding of previous research in this field by overseas scholars. In the same year, Lin graduated from the School of Fine Arts. She chose the School of Drama at Yale University, which was located about 200 kilometers from Harvard. Under the guidance of the renowned theatrical master, Professor Beck, she began studying the art of stage design. This is a play that Phyllis Lynn did the settings for one of the scenes. Here's the photograph from that setting that she designed. In 1928, Liang and Lin were about to return to China. Their overjoyed father began to make arrangements for their futures. Liang's classmate, Yang Tingbao, had been invited to establish the Department of Architecture at National Northeastern University in Mukden. Because he had already taken a job with an architect's company, he recommended Liang. Liang Chichao proposed to Tsinghua that Liang be hired as a lecturer on architectural design. But Liang Chichao decided later that National Northeastern University was the better choice. In early 1928, Liang Sichung and Lin Huiyin completed their overseas studies and also consummated the fruit of their love. The newlyweds accepted a travel itinerary designed by their father and embarked on their honeymoon in Europe to examine classical architecture. During their travels, they received a letter from their father. Sicheng, Huiyin, I've been writing for two months for the children. The best I can tell you is that my body is very strong. I've been working for a long time. 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 和平常健康人一样。你们远游中得此消息，一定高兴百倍。In fact, 
A month earlier, Liang Chichao had one of his kidneys removed, but the operation had not been successful. He had less than one year to live as he waited in anticipation for his children to return from afar. Si in early August 1928, after four years away, Liang and Lin returned to Peking. They spent a short time with their father in Tianjin, and then in September, they both took up their positions at National Northeastern University. But only one month later, their father's condition worsened. On January 19, 1929, Liang Chichao passed away. It was not until he turned 18 that Liang Chichao first saw a map of the world. But this same young man with extraordinary vigor and talent became a pioneer in an age of national apathy. Claiming indisputable leadership, he led the reform of the ancient imperial state. He benefited from traditional China as well as the modern West and he advocated radical change and also supported steady progress. His life was fraught with change, and he seems to be under the constant imperative to examine the old self and urge for a new self. The Liang children must have felt blessed to have such a father who was honest about his true feelings, cordial, intimate, loving and reliable. To his children, he left the best treasure that he could bestow, the strength of personality. I Wamei 